Yeah, so a common problem these days is a lot of these old CRTs, like this Amtrad CTM640, now just starting to fail. And the problem I'm really having a serious issue with, and that's finding somebody who will actually work on them and repair on them. Uh, most repair agents just aren't interested. And that gives us a bit of a problem, because most of us collectors, I think, spend a lot of our time just dealing with digital parts, and haven't really got into the analog stuff that's in a lot of these CRTs. So it's a big learning curve for many of us, and a lot of us are also afraid of the voltages inside the display. And that, that's a good fear to have. Um, don't just go in there and start fiddling with crap and just assume you're safe because it is off. I mean, the tube itself will hold a charge. Capacitors will hold a charge. You need to be very careful. Before you touch something, you need to know what it is. You can't just grab things and manhandle things. Um, some people may get away with that, but if you plan it safe, just do it properly. One good trick a friend told me was that if you are working in one of these CRTs, one hand behind your back at all times, and that prevents you from accidentally holding onto the chassis and then grabbing the high voltage cable at the same time, and suddenly you're the path of least resistance. Now you want to avoid doing that, you want to keep it nice and safe, and have a good time. So, you know, what I wanted to do today is I wanted to show you guys sort of basically what I learned. Now I'm a complete amateur at this, I am learning, so that does mean I'm probably going to use wrong terminology here and there, but I'm just hoping maybe I can share just a little bit of insight into what I found in this circuit and how I worked out things work. So during this repair I did learn quite a bit, as usual, uh, and there are a couple of points of confusion, and uh, we'll get to those once I actually come into this. So the absolute first place I started is I wanted to make sure, as you should do, that voltage was actually coming into the system and it was successful. And we check these points here on T501, these outputs, and I was expecting around 100 volts out here, and that's exactly what I had, and I was expecting around 9 volts out here, and that was what I had. So that was all relatively happy within spec. Great. And that meant that this whole left side of the board, that way, I could just completely ignore and stay away from it. And a lot of that was one big particular IC, which is good, so that eliminated a whole bunch of stuff right off the bat. Now, the, 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 actual, problem, the actual problem that I understood was that we weren't getting 5 volts out the front of it, so that it wouldn't turn the computer on. And I don't know if it needed the computer to be on to display something. So the absolute first thing we started with was the 5 volt circuit. Now this top part of the circuit here, I was finding voltages and things were relatively happy. We had expect them to be up here. But I looked up the data sheet for this part here. So this is an, I think it's a LK78MG. And it's a DC voltage regulator. And this one's set up for 5 volts DC. It's supposed to be exactly 5.0 on the output. And I looked up on the data sheet and pin 1 is BCC. And so on here in the circuit diagram, it's marked 17.8. So you'd expect to see 17 volts there. And uh, yeah, zero. Completely zero. And I tracked it back around. I mean, this whole circuit in here it was just zero everywhere. There's absolutely no action. Now, the main feed for this is this 18.5 volts here, which goes down the bottom, up. And then we can track that back through R520 here. And this goes sideways through D404, up, and into pin 3 of the flyback. Now this is my absolute first point of confusion. I was trying to work out exactly how the circuit actually flowed electricity, where the electricity was actually going. Because when I would deal with transformers, I'll just screw it all over for a second. When I deal with transformers, I always expect a primary and a secondary side. So when I see these two coils here, my first thought is the top pins of both sets are going to be voltage supplies. And I couldn't really understand why they would run power in through pin 2 and then come out pin 3. I mean, it just didn't make any sense to me. What I eventually worked out, and it was, it's sort of obvious when you look at the circuit diagram, but it was just something I hadn't seen before. I wasn't, com yeah, I wasn't experienced with it. But this is actually the feedback coil on the flyback. So no voltage goes in here. These are all outputs. And oh, that was the biggest, most confusing thing. It, it actually took me quite a bit of studying this thing to work out how this works. But basically the idea is this primary coil up here gets pulsed with 100 volts DC and that induces a current on the secondary side and the secondary side you see it keeps on coiling down here and that induces a current back on this side over here and from memory I think that's the positive voltages and I think this one might produce negative voltages. So the first thing you note there is I mean the monitor is really reliant on this flyback spinning um, probably 90% of it is not going to do anything whatsoever if this flyback's not pulsing. 
So that's where the first thing I had to check was pins 6 and 11. And when I read them, they were both 111 volts. Well, so it was between 100 and 119 volts DC. I can't remember the exact number. Now, having the actual same voltage from ground was kind of concerning because to me that suggests that A, there's no current flow going through the uh, coil, so there's no actual complete circuit there. And it's definitely not alternating because it's not inducing any current. And yeah, I checked it on the multimeter, and it was a dead flat 100 volts DC, just as if I had a piece of wire. So that, you know, there was, there was no power going through it. So I had to work out how that circuit was powered. Now this bottom line, I did track down the bottom, and this goes to our T501, and it feeds off the uh, the 100, well, 110 volts DC down the bottom. So, you know, we understood where that wire came from. But this pin 11 at the top here, I had to work backwards. And we end up here at Q405. And you can just tell by looking at the circuit diagram that when this thing turns on, it pulls that line down to ground, and if you imagine 100 volts DC being pulled to ground, it's going to just induce a huge surge of current through the transformer. And then it flicks off, goes back, and then pulses it again, and each time it pulses it, we're inducing current on that secondary side. So this has to be flicking. Now from memory, I think this flicks at something like 50,000 cycles per second. Um, it does a very, very quick part, and it's a likely part for failure because of that. And there's high current load and it's slamming on and off 15,000 times a second, it's a serious piece of part. But we checked this negative 13.7 here and uh, yeah, there was nothing coming in. Looked at it on the oscilloscope, it was zero volts and it was completely flat. So then we went to T401 and we had the same thing. We just There was no alternating current going through that, nothing being pulsed. Come back to Q404 which feeds it and we looked at the base of that and yeah, completely flat. There was nothing there. I think this 32 volt measurement it shows here, I do remember picking that up, but there was nothing there. And then so we went up to pin 3 here on this 7800 CRT controller, and it's a Sanyo part, and there was absolutely nothing coming out of pin 3. Oh, okay, so, well let's check that part. So when I looked up the data sheet, and from memory it said pin 12 was the voltage pin, or the VCC. So I checked that, it says here on the, on the sheet 11.3, and it was zero. So, fault found? Well, no. So, I followed that line back and it goes to the feedback coil on the flyback. So, the, I mean, if, if that was how the circuit worked, that would mean that the flyback needs the CRT controller to be running, but the CRT controller needs the flyback to be running. So is it a, it's a whole chicken and egg scenario. I mean, it just it just can't work. So I started hunting around trying to find some weird way that this circuit might accidentally trip into that loop, but I didn't come up with anything. Then someone pointed out down here on pin 15, we've got this little diode symbol here, and it's 12.5 volts, which is quite a convenient number. And so we had the theory that perhaps on that particular pin, um, that's actually what runs the left side of this chip here, the horizontal oscillation. And it turns out that was correct. Uh, I checked this pin here. I did have I had 11.7 volts DC, which is not spec, but it's pretty close. And I would have expected at least something to be coming out of pin three with that. So the first thing I did was order a 7800 IC. Now you might think, well, 1980s CRT controller IC, you're never going to find that. It's going to be on AliExpress or it's going to be on eBay, and you're going to be waiting two months for it to be delivered. It's not true. Um, I found it locally in stock. Five dollars plus shipping, and it was here the next day, overnight delivery. Uh, so I guess it must be just a lot of CRTs out there that use this chip, and they just have a lot of stock. I was surprised. I, th I just thought that was awesome, anyway. So anyway, so I went and ordered this new chip, and I went to solder it in, and also in the process, I did identify a bad capacitor. The C405 here had completely shot out the bottom of the can, so the can had actually lifted off the top of the capacitor. It was definitely a goner. Now. Usually when you see a capacitor like that, you immediately blame the bad cap as being the problem. But when I did look at pin 15 here, I did have a completely flat DC signal. Um, so I, I don't think the filter cap being there or not really would have made a huge difference. But I could be wrong, it was the obvious part to replace. I had a spare one in stock, so I soldered it in at the same time. Once I had the new chip in there, and had the new capacitor in there, hit the power switch and I got a video signal. Needed some adjustments, but after I did the adjustments I had a perfectly crisp clean display, been playing games on it for hours, 
and it's just faultless. It was, yeah, a $5 IC and a 50 cent capacitor and we were away.